Our next speaker is Ellen Weaver. She's the president and CEO of the Palmetto Promise Institute, an independent nonpartisan educational foundation committed to policy entrepreneurship, consensus building, and transformative solutions to South Carolina's policy challenges. An accomplished veteran of policy and politics, she spent 12 years working inside Senator Jim DeMint's office in various capacities in South Carolina and DC. She was clearly a trusted member of his executive team. Most recently, we see her as a champion of the people of our great state, shaping conversations and policies that impact our children's education, energy, healthcare, jobs, and taxes. I've come to really appreciate Ellen, not only for her dedication to the people of our state, but for her positive message, one of possibility and encouragement for our future and that of our children. Ellen Weaver. All right, I've promised that I'll stand behind the microphone here, so I'll try to try to keep my promise. What a joy um, to be with such a dedicated group of citizens this morning, and it's just such um, a delight to be able to be with Diane and Stacy, who I consider sisters in freedom. It is just incredible to know that we have this kind of talent and energy in South Carolina who are willing to invest their time, even though they have very little of it when they are taking care of their families and the many obligations that you all have on your time. So thank you for being engaged and thank you for bringing together this great group of people. It's a real honor to be with you today. I'm very humbled um, to follow the two speakers that, that you, we just heard. Um, and if you think about um, the different topics that we're covering, when you put that in context, so, so Curtis talked about our, our financial future. Um, and just as a quick side note, I really want to put to myth or to rest the myth of South Carolina as a low tax state. Um, over the next couple of uh, months, we are working very hard on a project that is pulling together data about taxing and spending in South Carolina in a way that I don't think it's ever been pulled together and presented so that citizens and lawmakers can actually understand it. Because like he said, the data is very scattered in these various agencies. It's very complicated. And there are too few people who are asking the right questions to get the right answers. And so what we have found just preliminarily in some of the early research that we've done is that at the state level, when you look at our taxes, yes, our they may be low relative to other states, but when you squeeze one end of the balloon, it blows up the other end of the balloon. And county and local spending and taxes have grown astronomically in the last 20 years in South Carolina. Um, so anyway, stay tuned for stay tuned for more of that. But Curtis talked about our financial future. Obviously, Congressman Duncan talked about our national security. Today, I want to talk to you about education, which I think is the third pillar of a strong community. If you really think about it, children and their education are the future of this state. If we are not effectively educating our children, not only are we not preparing ourselves to be economically competitive in a global marketplace, but we are not training and equipping the people who are going to be the future of preserving this great American experiment that we all love so much and that is the reason why we are here today. And so that's one reason why I am so passionate about education in South Carolina. Education is an issue that belongs in the state. We need to pull power back from Washington, but we need to be ready with good ideas and good solutions as we are able to devolve that power out of Washington. And the fact is, we have not been ready here in South Carolina to effectively educate our children for any number of years. And unfortunately, those children are the one paying the price, but as are all of we. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you today. My own um, education journey, I may have shared with you when I was here last year, but for those of you who, um, who weren't here, um, I was uh, a, a, a student at a small Christian school from kindergarten through fifth grade. I was homeschooled sixth through 10th grade, and then I graduated from public school 11th and 12th grade. So I've really seen the whole gamut of education options um, that, that you can have. And I know in my personal experience, 
how each situation uniquely equipped me for what I needed at that particular point in time in my education um, journey. So the, the message that I have for you today is that one size in education does not fit all. And unfortunately, for too long, that has been the reigning mentality amongst educators and amongst people who are making education policy. The good news is, is that that is changing. It's not changing fast enough, but it is starting to change. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. So first of all, I'd like to just kind of do a quick run through of what is school choice, because, you know, especially in South Carolina over the last decade, I think when people hear the word school choice, they think automatically of a voucher. Okay, well, vouchers are one type of school choice, but really there are many, many different avenues by which parents can choose to educate their children. The first of those is charter schools. Here in South Carolina, we have um, a, a, a growing charter school sector. Um, as you see here, it's grown over 100% since 2008. But we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of potential of what high-performing charter schools could do in South Carolina. Charter schools are public schools. Please know that. There is a lot of confusion about what charter schools are. They are not private schools. They are not selective in their admission criteria. They must take all students. Now, obviously, their capacity may be small, so there may be wait lists of students who can't get in if the school doesn't have room, but they are a public school. Um, unfortunately, in South Carolina, our charters, though, are not treated like our traditional public schools. They are paid much less uh, per pupil. A lot of times, they're not getting the local funding, and there's also no facilities funding or transportation funding, which has really uh, limited the growth of, of charters in the state and something that we're working to address. But this is the Lisinski family, and they have two adopted sons who are now thriving at a charter school in Charleston. Um, this is the Wood family. They are in Columbia. They have two biological daughters who they homeschooled. When those daughters grew up and moved out of the house, the Woods realized that they had so much love and capacity left in their hearts that they adopted five children from overseas, and they are now homeschooling all five of those children. Approximately 23,000 students are homeschooled in South Carolina, and this is really a bright spot in South Carolina in terms of the fact that we have a great homeschool law here. There are three different accounts accountability options under which parents may choose to homeschool their children. And so this is a really robust and growing option here in South Carolina. When I was homeschooled back in the early 90s, there were very few resources in place to support families who chose to homeschool. And I'm happy to say that that really is changing now. There are co-ops, resource centers, so many different online uh, supplements that parents can use for their children's education. And so homeschooling, consequently, is growing here in South Carolina. Magnet schools are another form, like charters, of public school choice, except that magnet schools are actually within the traditional district system. Um, they can exist as an individual school, such as the Military Magnet School in Charleston, which is just an incredible place. It serves a predominantly African-American, low-income population. They have former military members that serve as many of their teachers, and their graduation rate is in the high 90s. So you want to talk about a real success story of people who are looking at education differently than the traditional model, but yet within the traditional system, who are actually meeting the needs of the students in their community. So magnet programs are very diverse. There's a lots of different kinds, you know, STEM programs, arts programs, military programs, single gender programs, um, and they serve about 75,000 students in South Carolina. Virtual schools is something that is really growing in our state, and obviously as we think about how we can harness new technologies to better serve students, um, I think that this is something that we will continue to see grow. Currently, there are 8,700 students who are in virtual charter schools here in South Carolina, and um, we also have a program through the Department of Education that is known as Virtual SC, in which students who are in public schools can take online, um, online courses, and we've seen a huge growth than that. Um, obviously, you all are familiar with private schools. They currently enroll over 66,000 children in our state. This is the Washington family. Um, they come from Charleston as well, and they are going to the Meeting Street Academy, which some of you all may have heard of. It's a very exciting model um, that provides a low-cost, world-class private school education for families who could otherwise not afford it. Um, and so their children have really found a special place and are thriving um, at the Meeting Street Academy in Charleston. 
This is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, our special needs tax credit scholarships. This was a huge victory when this program was enacted three years ago. And it is very small right now. Um, the program is capped at $8 million um, for the tax credit scholarship portion, and then $4 million, an additional $4 million in parental tax credits. And these programs go to serve students who are classified as having exceptional needs. So we would think of them as the traditional disability or special needs population in our schools. And so what this program does is it allows the citizens of South Carolina to contribute some of their tax liability to a scholarship funding organization that then in turn gives scholarships to students who are not being served well in the traditional school system to go to a school of their parents' choice. And so this program is still small, but in its first three years, we have seen over 3,000 scholarships awarded. And I believe that this is something that is going to continue to be an avenue for growth to get every student the education that they need in our state. This is Cody, and he uh, goes to Hidden Treasure School in Greenville, which is just a wonderful, wonderful special needs um, school here in the upstate. And he had experienced pretty severe um, emotional behavioral issues in a more traditional classroom setting. And um, he's had you know, a really, I think, tough life, uh, been adopted consequently by his grandparents, who didn't have the money to pay for the kind of education that he, need, he needed. And so to hear his grandmother talk about what this program has meant for their family and the hope and, and joy that they have in seeing Cody get the education that allows him to reach his full potential and the turnaround that they've seen in his academic performance and behavior. There's just no question that this is an exciting program and it's working. And what I love about it is that it is showing legislators who have traditionally been very hostile to the idea of using what they think is their money, but it's really taxpayer money, um, to help parents get choices outside of the traditional public system. It's showing them that there's really nothing to be afraid of, um, that these programs can work, and that if we're truly focused on a student-centered experience and helping students meet their full potential, we need to have an all-of-the-above approach. We can't continue to do the one-size-fits-all. So in summary, nearly one in every five children in South Carolina are currently participating in some sort of school choice option. And that's a growing constituency and something that as an organization, we believe we want to harness and we need to harness the energy of these families and these parents because no one speaks more passionately on behalf of their child than their parent. And so that is something that we're gonna be asking for your help with here at the end is just getting this information in front of parents. We really need the voices of parents because when you think about it, um, there is a very entrenched and powerful education interest group here in this state. We don't have unions in South Carolina, but we do have trade associations for administrators, for school boards, for teachers. And those associations oftentimes, I don't believe, are representing what's actually in the best interest of the folks that they claim to represent. They're about preserving the power and the uh, money that, they, that, that, that props them up and that gives them relevance and, and authority. And so parents, we believe, are, is the voice that can counteract that with legislators. And so we're very excited about the work of trying to harness the power and voices of parents. So why school choice? Well, number one, it puts parents in, cho in charge. We know that parents know better than bureaucrats what their children need. And when you look at parent satisfaction surveys in school choice programs in South Carolina and around the country, there is overwhelming parent satisfaction with um, the education that their child is receiving when they have had the ability to choose where that child goes. In school choice, dollars follow the child. And I love this quote from the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. It says, as enrollments change based on families' choices, so too should the funding. The purpose of public education is to educate the public. So again, the purpose of putting our tax dollars into public education is not to prop up a system, regardless of whether it's educating children or not, is to actually be producing the outcome of educated children. And if the current system is not doing that, we have to say, whoa, 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 we have got to reevaluate what we're doing here. 
And then thirdly, it delivers real results for students in several different areas. For example, graduation rates go up. DC's Opportunity Scholarship Program, which is something that Congressman Duncan and Senator Scott have been leaders in fighting for in Washington, has a 91% graduation rate, which is 20% higher than their counterparts in non-scholarship private schools and 29% higher than folks who are in the D.C. public school system, which is a huge, huge increase when you think about the home life challenges and the economic challenges that many of the students who get these um, scholarships face. I've been in a Christian school um, in Anacostia, D.C., which is a very rough environment. And the hope and the optimism that these children have despite the circumstances that are stacked against them, because they know that they are getting a good education is inspiring. And I wish all of you could just see the joy on their faces as they learn in an environment that is just right for them. It also increases college enrollment. Um, African-American students who received a, a private school voucher were 20% or 24% more likely to enroll in college than their peers who did not. And that statistic actually comes out of New York. Um, academic achievement. I talk a lot about Florida because Florida has really been on the leading edge of the school choice movement for the last 15 or so years. Low income students receiving Florida's tax credit scholarship equaled and surpassed the national average of all students in academic achievement. So when you think about the uh, hardship that students in poverty face when they come to school every day. When you're delivering those kind of results for low income children, to me, it proves it's possible. And then, of course, something that we all appreciate is taxpayer savings. Again, out of Florida, um, their nonpartisan Office of Government Accountability concluded that for every $1 in, quote, lost tax revenue due to private scholarship contributions, the state actually saved $1.49 in education funding. So that's a great net, net gain for taxpayers. And that's something that we really need to think about here in South Carolina because Hurricane Gray is coming. What is Hurricane Gray. Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, we recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, just put out a report um, talking about the age dependency ratio in South Carolina. So simply explained, for every 100 South Carolinians that there are in a room, currently 59% of those people are riding in the government benefits cart, which means they are either under the age of 18 and consuming taxpayer dollars in terms of public education, or they are over the age of 65 receiving primarily health care benefits from the state. By 2030, we expect that that will be 79 out of every 100 people who are consuming benefits versus paying for those benefits. And so that, to me, argues that we have got to figure out how we are going to deliver high quality education services for kids at a cost that we can not only afford as taxpayers, but that we can sustain as a state. And that's why we're working on a plan that we call the HOPE plan, Help Our Pupils Excel. I worked in DC long enough that you have to have a good acronym for everything. So I figured HOPE, and also I love HOPE because it's in one of our state mottos, Doom Spiro Spiro, while I breathe I hope. We have such a sense of optimism in our state that in spite of adversity, we know that there is power in people coming together to work on behalf of their communities. And so we are working for eight um, proven affordable solutions to the Abbeville rule, things that we see we already have here in South Carolina that are growing, or things that we see around the country that we think we should bring to South Carolina. So real briefly, um, we need to equitably fund our charter schools, which I talked to you about before. Our charters do not receive transportation funding, and they do not receive facilities funding. This creates an enormous barrier to access to low-income children. We have charter schools in our state that are delivering excellent educations to the students that they are able to serve. And if they have the ability and the funding to replicate, we could open new charter schools all over this state and serve students who currently could not access, 
access that option. We are also working on an idea called course access that we have seen take off exponentially in Louisiana. I told you earlier about virtual SC, the digital learning program that the Department of Education has. Well, that's only programs provided through the traditional public school system. In Louisiana, they have broken that model wide open and have an array of providers from all over the country that are getting high quality learning, the best teachers into schools and classrooms that otherwise could not afford to have that teacher. Um, and when you think about the needs in our rural school districts, we've been hearing a lot about that because of the Abbeville decision um, that the Supreme Court handed down a few years ago. What better way to get high quality teaching into some of these rural areas where a teacher may not want to move than to bring the best teachers into the classroom through virtual learning? We think it's a win-win and it's cost effective. So we're working very hard on that. Education savings accounts is something that I'm very excited about. We see it working in five other states, primarily Florida and Arizona. This is where a portion of the money that the state is already spending on education, so this is not new spending, this is redirecting current spending, is put into a personal account, much like a health savings account, that parents alone have the ability to access for a list of approved services. So I think of traditional education as kind of the rotary phone, one size fits all, you have your black phone and you know everybody's good to go. ESAs are really an iPhone that allow parents to completely customize the education of their children. They can spend this money on tuition, they can spend it on therapy if their child needs therapy, they can spend it on tutoring if they need help in math. If there are funds left over in this account at the end of the school year, you can actually roll it into a 529 and start saving for college. So you want to talk about an idea that would really empower the least of these to get a great education, it's education savings accounts. And then of course, we have all of these imaginary school district lines all over the state and schools that are half full because we don't have the political courage to do the C word, which is consolidate <laughs> uh, school districts. So we need to expand open enrollment to allow people within the traditional system to go to high quality schools and closed schools that simply aren't, aren't effective. So in summary, I know I'm out of time. Um, how can you get involved? Well, these are pictures from uh, this week's National School Choice Week, this year's National School Choice Week that we did in Columbia. So my organization is still fairly young. We are only three years old. The first year we existed, we celebrated National School Choice Week. We had 250 people in a room. The next year, last year, we had 1,000 people at the State House. This year, we had 3,000 people in Columbia from across the choice spectrum, all those different choices that I started with you, who were letting lawmakers know that their education is working for them and that they think that every parent in South Carolina should have the opportunity to choose the education that is best for their, their child. Um, you can help us by joining the Parent Power Network. This is the thing that I mentioned to you that we're really trying to get off the ground to engage parents. Um, because it's the power of parents and their voices that is ultimately going to make a difference in this discussion. We publish a publication every year called Empower Opportunity. You can pull it down online at myseducation.org. At that same website, you can also sign up to get email updates about education issues, and we promise not to spam your inbox, but just to send you information that's truly important. But if you know people who have school-aged children, please send them to this resource. This outlines all of the options Options that we have in South Carolina and tells parents how they can use them. This is really a resource guide for parents because parents can't make a good decision if they don't have good information, which is why I so much appreciate this ability to inform people because that's really what it's all about. And then be a choice champion. Um, if you would like to engage versus, or over um, your phone, which everything has gone to the phone, it's kind of amazing that you can live your entire life on your phone now. Um, you can actually text SC Choice to 52886 and that will loop you into that parent power network and choice champion network that we're talking about. So in summary, I'll just say that I really love what Diane said in her remarks about the power residing in local communities. We could get so discouraged about what's happening at the national level, but the fact is, is that we have the energy, we have the consensus, and we have the will to get things done here at the state and local level. And I would submit to you that one of the most, if not the most important thing that we have got to get right as a state is the education of our children. They are the future in every way imaginable, and I am so honored to have the opportunity to fight on their behalf, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit with you today about what we're doing. So thank you.